Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. We're going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Yesterday, we were talking about this blasphemous decree of the papacy called Papal Infallibility. The papacy arrogating to itself divine attributes, infallibility, and also that his law is immutable. <laughs> yes, and we were also talking about Archbishop Manning's teachings on papal infallibility, making sure that the Roman Catholic world and the entire world understood perfectly what papal infallibility really means. And I think you'll find it startling, and as we, as, as we consider what Archbishop Manning has said about papal infallibility, I want to, this morning, as I did yesterday morning, remind you to hold as a backdrop to what we are about to read in this book, the passage from Isaiah chapter 14 particularly verses 12 through 15, and I'll read those for your refreshment. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is treason. Satan committed treason against his Creator. And he issued this prophecy a five-pointed prophecy, the center of which was a declaration. I will. He will ascend above the heights of the clouds and be like the Most High? Here's what God's answer was to this blasphemous, false prophecy. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15, God answers immediately. He says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Okay? I want that passage of Scripture to be constantly in the back of your mind as we continue to read this, this, this book. Has Satan tried through the creation of man to achieve this five-pointed prophecy? And if so, through whom does, does he achieve this? What agency on earth, what human agency on earth has Satan sought to fulfill this five-pointed false prophecy? Now, if you're following along in the book, we're on page 142, about halfway down the page, at the, uh, at the, at the first full paragraph. R.W. Thompson says, Nobody will deny that to concede the Pope's infallibility is equivalent to recognizing the obligation to do within the entire circle of faith and morals Whatsoever he shall command to be done. All the important acts of individuals and of society are necessarily within this circle. In other words, individuals and society. In other words, every man, woman, and child on the planet comes under this obligation to do whatsoever the Pope commands to be done, so that the whole man, in all that he does and thinks, as a social being and as a citizen, becomes by this doctrine, papal infallibility, subject to this obedience. You become subject to the Pope's obedience, or obedience to the Pope. 
And it says, whatever position he may fill in any relations of life, if he be a Christian, he acknowledges his responsibility to God and his obligation to obey his law. That law, therefore, must regulate all his intercourse with the world and encompass the whole field of his duty. Hence, as the devotee of infallibility looks to the Pope alone for the interpretation of the law of God, he consents to obey the Pope in whatsoever he shall declare it to be. He looks no further. He debates nothing. The Pope, with him, possesses the concentration in his own hands of all the power of heaven and earth, and sits upon so lofty a throne that no human being dares to challenge, who no human being dares to challenge the integrity of his motives or the propriety and expediency of his decrees. He considers the Pope as occupying a judgment seat before which all mankind must pass in review. He therefore accepts what the Pope does and says as infallibly right and true. He makes no inquiry about it, but closes his mind to all investigation and thought. He passively submits to think and to do everything the Pope shall decree and pronounces all to be heretics and disbelievers in Christianity who doubt or deny the virtue and propriety of his submission. No matter what the doctrine he is required to believe or the thing he is required to do, his obedience must be complete. Now, the Catholic world had this to say, quote, Each individual must receive the faith and law from the church, that is, the Pope, of which he is a member by baptism, with unquestioning submission and obedience to the intellect and the will. Now, I'm going to read a note that the author puts at this point a very strategic, a very, very consequential and important note that this author includes at this point in the reading. But I'll finish the quote, and then we'll come back and talk about this specifically. We're going to talk about baptism for a little bit. Now, let me read the entire quote in its entirety, and we'll come back and talk about the pertinent part. Each individual must receive the faith and the law from the church, that is, the Pope, remember, because he is the church, because he's infallible. Uh, The church of which he is a member by baptism, with unquestioning submission and obedience of the intellect and the will. Authority and obligation are correlative in nature and extent. We have no right to ask reasons of the church, that is, the Pope, any more than of Almighty God, as a preliminary to our submission. We are to take with unquestioning docility whatever instruction the church, that is, the Pope, gives us, unquote. Now, we're going to go back and talk about baptism for a little bit. Let me read the pertinent part of this quote. He said, each individual must receive the faith and the law from the church, that is, the Pope, of which he is a member by baptism, with unquestioning submission and obedience of the intellect and the will. You are a member of the Roman Catholic Church by baptism. You say, well, I'm not a Catholic. So I'm not a member of the Roman Catholic Church. I wasn't baptized into the Roman Catholic Church. The authority and the infallibility of the Pope means nothing to me because I'm not Roman Catholic because I wasn't baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. Listen to this. The author gives us a quote. He says, It would seem from a recent letter of Pope Pius IX to the Emperor of Prussia that all baptized Protestant Christians are, in some mysterious way, also bound 
to this obedience, that is, obedience to the Pope, a claim which may or may not be here and after set up according to circumstances. He says, quote, I speak in order to fulfill one of my duties, which consists in telling the truth to all, even to those who are not Catholics, for everyone who has been baptized belongs in some way or other, which to define more precisely would be here out of place, belongs, I say, to the Pope, unquote. This was reported in the Cincinnati Commercial in October 30th, 1873. This Pope has, has told the Emperor of Prussia that by baptism, the Pope should expect obedience even from Protestants because they've been baptized. Now, let me explain his, his theory here. As we've discussed on many other occasions on Inquisition Update, Roman Catholicism believes that baptism is the sole jurisdiction of the Roman Catholic Church. It's a sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church, and that God gave the sacrament of baptism to the Roman Catholic Church and only to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, if you're, uh, from its point of view, if you're baptized in a Protestant church, has a choice. They can either acknowledge your baptism as placing you under the authority and supremacy and infallibility of the Pope, or they can just simply choose not to, to acknowledge your baptism at all. In which case, in either case, uh, <laughs> you're in big trouble. How convenient, right? The Pope's just simply gobbling up all the Protestants by saying if they're baptized, then they come mysteriously, one way or another, under my jurisdiction and under my control. Because I am the fountain of the Roman Catholic Church, that Church of Jesus Christ, the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church. I am Jesus Christ on earth, and if they be baptized, they are mine. Do you comprehend his logic? So you may protest the Pope, but in the Pope's mind, particularly Pope Pius IX and every Pope since him, and particularly the, Pope's who the Pope who presided over Vatican Council II, says if you've been baptized, you're mine. And whether you assent to it or not, I have divine right authority over your soul and your being. And I may do with you as I please, excommunicate or elevate you to the stars. Again, he says, each individual must receive the faith and law from the church, that is the Pope, of which he is a member by baptism, with unquestioning submission and obedience of the intellect and will. If you're baptized, whether you're sprinkled or dunked, if you have participated in the sacrament of baptism, according to the Roman Catholic Church's definition of it, then you must submit unquestioningly. You must obey unerringly both your intellect and will. You must conform to the authority and teachings and proclamations of the papacy and that your, this authority of the Pope and your obligation to obey are correlative in nature and extent. He says, we have no right to ask reasons of the Church or the Pope any more than of Almighty God as a preliminary to our submission. We are to take with unquestioning docility whatever instruction the Pope gives us, unquote. Do you see Vatican Council II in a different light? Do you see ecumenism in a different light? Ecumenism is just, is just acquiescence to this decree. 
The Pope's infallible. You participated in the in the uh, sacrament of baptism, which belongs uh, exclusively to the Roman Catholic Church. And if you're ecumenically united with us, then you must come into full communion. You've accepted the sacrament of baptism. You're either in or you're out. Make your decision. And that's what the ecumenical movement has done. It has given the ultimatum to all baptized persons. You either come home to mama or else. Because you've participated in baptism, that gives me authority over you, and I may do with you as I please. And that's what's happening in this country. Baptism is all important in the Roman Catholic Church. It's the key that unlocks the door to the Pope's control over your life. Lock, stock, and barrel. Your intellect and your will. That's how Pope Pius IX saw it, and I guarantee you that's how the Pope sees it today. Now, continuing, it says, God beneficently endowed man with the faculty of reason, not merely to fit him for dominion over the animal creation, but that he might be able to distinguish good from evil, right from wrong. We do not discuss the, or, uh, the question whether as it regards each individual, God foreknew which of these he would prefer to follow. That, fo that belongs to the theologians. But he has sufficiently shown by the whole course of his providence that each one of us will be dealt with at the final judgment as we shall have personally acted in this life. This sense of personal responsibility every man feels within himself. And there should be no authority upon the earth sufficient to deaden the conscience of it in his mind. If he allows such authority to step in between him and God, so as to close his mind to the investigation of truth, he necessarily surrenders his conscience into its keeping. Into its keeping. In other words... Those who acquiesce to the infallibility of the Pope have no need of a conscience. And they simply surrender their conscience to the Pope's keeping. If he allows such authority to step in between him and God so as to close his mind to the investigation of truth, he necessarily surrenders his conscience into its keeping, forfeits his right to think, and suffers himself to be drifted along like a log afloat in, insensibly upon the water, either by chance, blind necessity, or by rules prescribed by those who know nothing of his personal convictions or relations and are influenced by motives he cannot understand." The most ignorant and unlettered man knows, without the aid of instruction, that the laws of God require him personal obedience, and that he cannot shield himself for their violation behind what others have thought or commanded. He knows that it is God who commands, and that his conscience has been given him as a monitor to approve, uh, approve the right and condemn the wrong a duty which blunt as he may as uh, excuse me a duty which blunt it as he may it never fails to discharge if then he suffers his intellect and will into the keeping of another if he surrenders excuse me someday i'll learn to read i'll try to be careful here this is important if the man surrenders his intellect and will into the keeping of another, that is the Pope, no matter who, says the author, and yields unquestioning submission and obedience to whatever that other shall command, his conscience becomes of no use to him, and he is reduced to the condition of a mere machine, like the locomotive which moves or stops 
as the engineer shall open or close the valve of the engine. So he acts or ceases to act as he shall be directed. Now the Apostle Paul reasoned with the Jews at Thessalonica, Corinth, and Ephesus, and with Felix out of the Scriptures. And he persuaded them to hearken to the divine command. But such a man does not expect to be reasoned with or persuaded. He awaits only the order of some superior, and then forthwith renders unquestioning submission and obedience. In other words, what the Pope is requiring of every unquestioning mind of his infallibility has simply surrendered that which Paul, the Apostle, cultivated. He surrenders his will and his conscience to the safekeeping of the Pope. When Paul challenged God's people through reason, through persuasion, through the Scriptures, this is antithetical to the gospel Paul preached, this papal infallibility, this check your brain, your Bible, and your conscience at the door, just sit down, shut up, and do and believe whatever I, the Pope, tell you to do. That's uh, kind of like uh, raising the Pope's throne above the stars of heaven, isn't, doesn't it? It's kind of like sitting upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, kind of like being ascending above the heights of the clouds, kind of like being like the Most High, isn't it? Unquestioning submission and obedience. That's what the Pope wants. Paul wanted you to reason through the Scriptures. This is the spirit of Antichrist. This is the spirit of Nicolaitanism. Submission of the laity. Now, he humbles and humiliates himself into the low attitude of one who knows his master and realizes no necessity for further knowledge. That's the Roman Catholic. He surrenders to his master unquestioningly. He requires no further knowledge. What does our Bible say? You reject knowledge, you reject me. You reject knowledge, therefore I will reject you. But a Roman Catholic doesn't seek knowledge, he just seeks to obey. A man, a filthy little man, a representative not of Christ, but of Satan himself. The human medium through which the fallen Lucifer, Satan, the one who declared treason against the throne of God, seeks to fulfill his five-pointed false prophecy of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. The papacy is the fulfillment of Satan's plan, not God's. And no greater demonstration can be made than what is revealed in this book by R.W. Thompson, The Papacy and the Civil Power. Unquestioning submission and obedience. That is what is required of every Roman Catholic. No, not just every Roman Catholic, but everyone who has been baptized. No, not those who have only been baptized, but every man, woman, and child on the planet must obey unquestioningly and submit completely to the decrees of the papacy because he's the representative of Jesus Christ on the earth. There's no greater authority in the, on the planet, according to the Pope. He's elevated his throne above the stars of God. He's sitting upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He's like the Most High. So says he. 
and the world just unquestioningly acquiesces. The Protestants, the evangelical bellies in this world just passively acquiesce to this blasphemy, justifying it as Christianity? How do they... Uh, how do they square what they now believe with what Paul taught? Isn't that why Paul taught them to read the Scriptures? Now, every Roman Catholic humbles and humiliates himself into the low attitude of one who knows his Master and realizes no necessity for further knowledge. And such is the condition into which the papacy proposes to reduce all the members of the Roman Catholic Church, whatever degree of intelligence they may otherwise possess, by the doctrine of papal infallibility. I am infallible. You must obey. Don't think. Don't question. Just obey. And not only is this obedience to be rendered in what concerns faith and morals, but also in what concerns the government and discipline of the church in everything necessary to bring the individual into complete, quote, hierarchical submission and true obedience, unquote. In the first dogmatic constitution passed by the late Lateran Council of 1870, it says, quote, Hence we teach and declare that by the appointment of our Lord, the Roman Catholic Church possesses a superiority of ordinary power over all other churches and that this power of jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff which is truly Episcopal, is immediate, to which all, of whatever right and dignity, both pastors and faithful, both individually and collectively, are bound by their duty of hierarchical submission and true obedience, to submit not only in matters which belong to faith and morals, but also in those that appertain to the discipline and government of the church throughout the world, so that the church of Christ may be one flock under one supreme pastor, through the preservation of unity, both of communion and of profession in the same faith with the Roman pontiff. This is the teaching of the Roman Catholic truth, from which no one can deviate without loss of faith and of salvation. Unquote. Do you believe the blasphemy of this? Once again, I read the false prophecy of Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's what Lucifer said. And God said, Yet... You will not. You will not ascend above the heights of the clouds. You will not ascend at all, but you will be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And through whom, through what human agency has Lucifer sought to fulfill this prophecy but in the papacy? There's no other institution in the world that most perfectly fulfills this false prophecy of Lucifer. And there's no other institution in the world that can rest assured that it will be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. God will not stand for this. 
And I'll tell you something else God won't stand for, and that's who some, the someone who claims the blood of Jesus Christ over his life and then submits to this papal imposter, ecumenically or otherwise. Now, I leave it to every Christian to examine his conscience, to examine the Scriptures, to examine what he believes and thinks, and arrive at your own conclusion under the conviction and leading of the Holy Spirit. Are you serving Christ truly, or are you serving Antichrist? You can't preach Jesus out of your mouth and serve Satan with your hands and your feet. You can't serve two masters because you'll love the one and naturally hate the other. Yes, hate the other. Choose you this day who you will serve. Now, the author continues, he says, in order to make this hierarchical, this hierarchical subordination complete, it is further decreed in this same constitution that the Pope must, be, must have free communication with the pastors of the whole church and with the flocks, that they may be taught and ruled by him in the way of salvation, and that his right of communication for this purpose must not be subject to the secular power. In other, gov in other words, the government can't step in and say, Whoa, Pope! These people are Americans. We have civil institutions that they're obliged to uh, uh, comply with. And, and, and your papal decrees tear at our government. No, they can't. The, the government can't stand in the way, remember? The church and state union, the, church is, uh, the state is subordinate to the church. That's what the Roman Catholic Church insists upon. He said this communication between the Pope and his people must not be subject to the secular power, must not be subject to the state, because it, the church, is higher than the government's and cannot be appealed from, which is precisely equivalent to saying that no government has the right to stand in between the Pope and his followers to prevent them from obeying what he shall command or to require of them to do what he shall forbid. This is called the prerogative which the only begotten Son of God vouchsafed to join with the supreme pontifical office, unquote. Wherefore, the Pope remains ever free from all blemish of error. It's kind of like the tail wagging the dog, right? He says, and upon this broad and comprehensive foundation, the decree of infallibility is announced with as much solemnity as if it had been and really sent down with the voice of 10,000 trumpets from the heavens. Thus, quote, we teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman Catholic pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is, from his throne, remember, he's going to sit upon the, upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He's going to exalt his throne above the stars of God. Here we're talking about his throne when he speaks ex cathedra from his throne. That is, when he, in discharge of his office of pastor and doctor of all Christians, by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine regarding faith and morals to be held by the universal church, by the divine assistance promised to him by the blessed Peter, is possessed of that infallibility which the divine Redeemer willed that his church should be endowed for defining doctrine regarding faith and morals and that therefore such definitions of the Roman Catholic pontiff are irreformable of themselves and not from the consent of the church. How's that for blasphemy? 
I declare from my throne, which is above the stars, which is above that throne of God, I declare from my throne everything regarding faith and morals, and I do it infallibly. And my word is irreformable. You know what the Bible, what term the Bible uses for this? Immutable. My word is immutable, says the Pope. It never changes. It cannot be appealed from. I am the highest authority in the universe. And I don't derive anything from the consent of the church. The councils, the fathers, the ecclesia, the papacy does not derive any of his power from the church, but from God himself. And that's what every Roman Catholic is to believe. And that is what everyone who is baptized is going to have to believe, according to the Pope. (laughs) Now he says, another quote, it says, But if anyone, which may God avert, presume to contradict this, our definition, let him be anathema. In other words, let him be damned. That's right. The Pope arrogates to himself the most powerful arrogation of God, and that is to damn the soul. Now, the full extent and scope of all this is not generally understood, particularly, I will add, among evangelibellies today, Indeed, it is not accurately comprehended by many intelligent Roman Catholics in this country who, imitating some of their bishops, have accepted it without inquiry. Such intelligence as they employ in ordinary matters would enable them to realize this if they had the courage to enter into such investigation. But having yielded this acquiescence, many of them from honest convictions of duty to the Church they are expected still further to submit passively and unresistingly to all its consequences, whatever they may be. Whether they shall continue to remain in this condition or not, however we who choose to act otherwise and look into these things for ourselves are not released from the obligation of ascertaining if possible what these consequences may be, so far at least as as our civil institutions are likely to be involved by them. It cannot be reasonably objected if in making this inquiry we shall take Archbishop Manning of England, who was a member of the Lateran Council, that's right, he went there in 1870, the first Vatican Council, to uh, listen to the Pope declare himself infallible. Yes, he saw it with his own eyes. He was a member of the Lateran Council, and he's one of the most distinguished prelates in the Roman Catholic Church, and he furnishes the correct papal interpretation, for it will not be said by anyone that he's not the very highest of Roman Catholic authorities. His, quote, pastoral to the clergy, that is, Archbishop Manning wrote a pastoral to the clergy of England, which was republished in the United States in book form, and in its American form it was entitled The Vatican Council and Its Definitions, thus giving it hierarchical endorsement here in America. Yes, this uh, Archbishop Manning that was just thoroughly impressed with this new dogma of the Roman Catholic Church that the Pope is now infallible, taught about papal infallibility, expounded upon it, really exposed what it means, that which we've been talking about. And it was republished right here in Protestant America. And the Roman Catholic hierarchy in the United States just loved it. Why? Because it is the object of their conquest of this once Protestant land. 
papal infallibility. This great and learned divine, Archbishop Manning, does not hesitate to come boldly up to the question of pontifical power. He displays the generalship of the old marshals of France who dashed against the heaviest columns of the enemy, not doubting that their courage would be rewarded by victory. Doubtless like them, he hopes that this that his intrepidity would intimidate all adversaries. That's right. He's infallible. That's supposed to intimidate his adversaries. I mean, who dare go up against the infallible, right? Who dares to question the infallible? He said, in the true spirit of imperial dogmatism... As if no earthly power dare question what he says, he tells us that the plentitude of power which belongs to the Pope is so great and overshadowing, quote, that no power under God may come between the chief pastor of the church and any from the highest to the humblest member of the flock of Jesus Christ on earth, unquote. Now, if it shall appear that in the domain of faith and morals, everything that a man may do in his relationship with society and government is included, there will be no difficulty whatever in understanding what he means by, de by denying to any human power the right of intervention between the Pope and the individual members of the Roman Catholic Church. If these terms are thus comprehensive, then his language is equivalent as saying that if the Pope shall command disobedience to any law of any government touching faith and morals and should declare that such law is opposed to the welfare of the Roman Catholic Church, then the Roman Catholic is bound to obey the Pope and disobey the government, which would have no right in such a case to interfere for its own protection." Upon a question of so much delicacy, he should have allowed to explain his own meaning. He should be allowed to explain his own meaning. He quotes from the councils and the fathers to show what is significant by the phrase faith and morals. The Council of Trent defines it to embrace things, quote, pertaining to the edification of the Christian doctrine, unquote. Jesuit priest Bellarmine extends it to those things which, quote, are in themselves good or evil, unquote, and Gregory of Valencia to, quote, any controverted matter of religion, unquote, as, for example, the controversy between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. See where this is going? which this last-named father also includes in his definition by embracing those things proposed by the Pope, quote, in deciding doctrinal controversies and exterminating errors, unquote. Isn't it funny, when the Roman Catholic Church talks about Protestantism, it also uses terms like extermination, It's not funny at all. History is defined by that doctrine. Archbishop Manning goes further than this and gives his own definition. He declares that the infallible guidance of the Roman Catholic Church, that is, the Pope, extends to all matters which are opposed to revelation. For, says he, quote, the Church could not discharge its office as a teacher of all nations unless it were able, with infallible certainty, to proscribe doctrines at variance with the Word of God, unquote. That is, the Word of the Pope. To make himself better understood, he assigns to infallibility two objects, one direct, the other indirect. The first is the revelation or the Word of God. The second, whatever is necessary for its exposition or defense, or is contrary to faith and morals. As the Pope can condemn errors in all these things, both direct and indirect, 
so according to him, he is infallible in proscribing false philosophers and false science, which enables him to reach out far beyond the commonly recognized domain of the church. He extends his authority so as to make it embrace also positive truths which are not revealed. Did you get that? Positive truths which are not revealed in the Word of God? Whensoever the doctrinal authority of the Roman Catholic Church cannot be duly exercised in the promulgation, explanation, and defense of revelation without judging and pronouncing on such matters and truths, which means that the Pope, as the exclusive judge of the faith, has full jurisdiction to pronounce against whatsoever is opposed to revelation, and that when his judgment is pronounced, it is infallibly right and must not only be recognized as a necessary part of the faith, but obeyed as such. Yes, his infallibility extends even beyond what God has revealed. Don't you know? He makes it extend also to the universal practice of the church in commending the writings of orthodox and of condemning those of heterodox authors. Here's the root of the the, uh, index of forbidden books. Since the Pope is the ultimate judge in everything that's right and wrong, judging faith and morals and whatever else he decides is under his jurisdiction, If he reads your book and he doesn't like what it says, like the Pope is Antichrist, your book automatically goes on the index of forbidden books. He not only judges what's right, he judges what's wrong. Also, to condemning heretical propositions, there goes Protestantism, and the ethical character of uh, propositions and propositions less than heresy, yes, The Pope is even good at hair splitting. Propositions less than heresy or erroneous propositions, that is, such as are scandalous, offensive, schismatic, or injurious, and more important and comprehensive than all, so that there may be no further cavile or controversy about it. This great Archbishop Manning declares that, quote, it belongs to the Roman Catholic Church alone to determine the limits of its own infallibility, unquote, which makes the whole matter rest upon the sole discretion of the Pope, so that upon whatsoever occasion or subject he shall claim to be infallible, then he is so. That there may be no misunderstanding upon a matter of such importance, he expresses the same idea elsewhere in these words, quote, The church itself, and by the word church he means the Pope, is the divine witness, teacher, judge of the revelation entrusted to it. There exists no other There is no tribunal to which appeal from the church can lie. There is no coordinate witness, teacher, or judge who can revise or criticize or test or question the teaching of the church. It is the sole and alone, that is, the the Roman Catholic Church is sole and alone in the world. Unquote. Shall I read to you again Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15, or can I just trust you to read it for yourself and compare it with these blasphemous? Were they not ridiculous arrogations of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical and historical Antichrist, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Prophecy fulfilled. Look no further. Thanks for listening. We'll continue tomorrow on Inquisition Update.